<laughs> Should I be talking? Nope. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're just play listening. By play. <laughs> <clears throat> It's one of my favorite songs. <laughs> oh, I love this song, yeah. A couple of my favorite musicians. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you. Vardan, I'm Zeppian, Peter Erskine. I'm Ryan McGillicuddy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. It was you guys. <laughs> yeah, really good. Really good. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as I get it a little more together here, um, my guest today <clears throat> is bassist Ryan McGillicuddy. Hello, Ryan. How you doing? <laughs> um, <clears throat> we, we did say our hellos in the beginning, but not too long. So now I have, <laughs> I have some catching up to do. <laughs> that was a good group and that was you know it's what's funny is um i have a little routine that i do here i look at i i put facebook on on my phone too so i can just check everything's okay from a different point of view and you know whose post was first Who's? june lee oh june is yeah like the the re one of the main reasons <laughs> uh you know anybody um June is the reason that most jazz musicians in Los Angeles were able to have a creative outlet for a good, uh, I'm going to say, 10 years. <laughs> but it was, actually. It was 10 years. I, I mean, he was kind of like, actually. like I would say, the heartbeat of uh, the yeah. Los Angeles jazz scene for quite a long time. Uh, and that, of course, that performance was at his club, The Blue Whale, um, which was everybody's favorite place to play. Um, I know it was mine, uh, but yeah, everything about that place was just the best. Like um, the audience that came, the, they were always there to see the music or listen to the music. And um, it was a listening room and it was kind of a safe space to creatively explore. There wasn't a lot of expectations uh, I, or I would say there was no no expectations from June as to what you had to play or what what you could play and what you could not play. Uh, he left that entirely up to the artists and uh, and trusted, I think, the artists to um, to bring something unique and something exceptional uh, to every performance there. So uh, I mean, he he was crucial, I think, to the to the jazz scene. Uh, I agree. That was very eloquently put. Uh, yeah, he had uh, he he has like a super deep heart, very sincere. <clears throat> I've known him for many years before too, because um, he actually came to me. I I used to teach at MI. When I stopped teaching, they still would send me vocal students, so he came to me like that, and um, he said. I, I like to sing jazz. I really don't. I don't, you know, and I said, okay, well, what do you know? He said, well, I know all the things you are. I was like, oh, okay. It's not a usual first song that people come with, you know, <laughs> and he was a jazz singer. And I said, <laughs> okay. I said, do you scat? And he said, oh no, not really. <laughs> well, he scatted. And so, you know, the, the thing he, that he lacked was experience, you know, but he actually, when he was in Korea as a, as a younger person, he would go to record stores and <clears throat> pick up records because of the covers, you know, the jazz records. And that's how he got into jazz. And, you know, he, he actually went to school for architecture, but then he just couldn't stop himself from, you know, creating the blue whale and stuff. And I remember when he called me and he said, Kath, I'm, I'm making a club. <laughs> I said, what? He said, yeah, downtown. I got it. And it's, it's in construction and everything. I was like, what? <laughs> 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 and, um, but he, so he, he was a, a, did you ever play with him singing? Well, I, I don't want to interrupt, but I have a hilarious story. Okay. About, like, let me tell you about this. So, yeah. The first time I met June was on a gig and oh. it was in Koreatown and uh, at it was that at weird little club. Shop. It was a oh. coffee shop. Okay, coffee shop. Yeah. And so I was hired to do the gig and I came down to the gig and it was supposed to be June and I and, and Bevan Manson, you know, Bevan, right? Sure. And so June and I, I, I arrived there and <laughs> June was there 
And it's the first time I met you. <laughs> and yeah, and so we were waiting for Bevan. And like, you know, the uh, downbeat time came and went, and we were both like, what's happening? Where's Bevan? Uh, this must have been in 2007 or six. And, uh, and anyways, uh, June and I were just like, well, what should we do? And June's like, uh, well, you know, he's like, we could just play duo. And myself, I was thinking, oh man, duo with, <laughs> you know, a singer. as you know, <laughs> as you know, Kathy, it's like, you really gotta be, you gotta have a lot of stuff together if it's, you know, just bass and, and voice. Singing. Cause yeah. you, I mean, you really, you don't have a piano, you don't have the harmony <laughs> stuff. So it's, you got to really make up um, for what you're missing. And I, I remember, I was like, well, let's just hold on a bit, see what happens to Bevan. Bevan called us and he's like, I've been in a car accident. <laughs> I'm not going to make it. <laughs> and so June and I were like, okay, you know, let's, let's give it a shot. And, <laughs> and it was just from the get go. I was like, oh my God, like he really knows what he's doing. And he was really creative. And I was yeah. like, man, this, and we had a blast, you know, we played, uh, we played the whole gig without Beth. <laughs> and uh, that was my first experience with him. And, and it was, yeah, it was great because he was really creative. He, you know, brought a lot to the table when we were playing and, and uh, it was fun. He was really fun to play with. <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah, he's a wonderful person and great, great, tasteful. And all that you said about him creating a space, that was, you know, that's definitely what he did. And he, his intentions were, to for that actually you know to have especially young musicians coming up and experimenting and um i remember when remember when the rules changed and uh you had to be 21. oh yeah and we were also like oh that's so too bad you know it's like yeah you know but um i mean it continued after that for another three or four years or something five years Mm -hmm. um but yeah really really great and but this post i mean i haven't seen a post from him for a long time so Mm. i'm so happy to to see that you know because he's just so he's ensconced with his family in korea you know right yeah so yeah but um yeah that was great and of course how when did you get to la i arrived in la in 2004 yeah. Okay, that's uh, that's quite a while ago. So was Rocco's? Let's see. Yes, was Rocco's happening then. Well, so <laughs> when I arrived, Rocco was doing something at Vibrato. Well, that was his place. Yes, it wasn't yes. Vibrato. It was a totally, <laughs> totally different room. Remember, you right. walked in and there was a lounge, like a, a shorter well, lounge and stuff. So that was like, I was, I did not experience Rocco's place as Rocco's place. I only experienced uh, it as Vibrato. Oh, he actually stepped into Vibrato. I don't remember that part. I think he, he uh, like the few times that I played there early on, like I remember I did something there with Anthony Wilson and, and I think maybe Rocco had set that up or something. Oh, you know? okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, Rocco was like, I mean, his place before the Blue Whale was the only place in town that was about modern jazz. Right. And, um, you know, Peter Erskine played there and and Bob Shepard and, you know, all the players like that. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, it was a really nice room. I played there with Ted Green, guitar player. Oh, yeah, right. <clears throat> and um yeah it was just really nice and Rocco even had a little thing that Adam Levy played at over on um near the musicians union the old musicians union on Melrose and Santa Monica oh yeah I'm sorry Melrose and Vine Santa Monica and Vine something like that right over right there. around there yeah yeah <clears throat> so yeah Rocco's pretty amazing I don't know if he's still involved with the I guess he is with the festival yeah <clears throat> that right. happens here <clears throat> I'm not sure if Jeff yeah, Gautier yeah. or Rocco, or maybe they both are involved with that. Yeah. The Angel City was, Festival. He was always pretty uh, close with June, too. Like they Very. worked in tandem. Yeah, he, he was definitely an advisor. And yeah, definitely. He helped a lot. Yeah. Um, 
So how did you, how did your tastes evolve? Were you, a, were you like just a, a, for a while, I know you went to North Texas and I know you yeah. came from a musical family, um, but were you, um, were you always playing bass and were you, did, were you playing regular gigs, casuals and stuff, or, um, you know, club gigs and then, and starting to work on more of your own taste, like mod more modern? Mm, uh, I would say no, like, <laughs> I think, you know, uh, the way my musical life unfolded was, I, I mean, first of all, it's like when I was in high school, I, I like my dad was a band director. And so oh. he kind of forced me to, <laughs> to play the electric bass because he needed a bass player. We came from, you know, it's a small town. <laughs> he was like, you know, he had a senior in high school who was going to graduate. So he started me like when I was in fifth grade on bass so i would be ready to play once i got to high school that's my um, guy <laughs> yeah but like what i learned was it was a valuable instrument to play yeah because everybody seemed to need a bass player and uh and then i got really lucky um i we went and did like these kind of all-state festivals and uh and like i had like a solo one year and they you know after we got home like they presented me with a scholarship to a jazz camp and uh I was like, wow, that's interesting. So I went to this jazz camp and it turns out like, I mean, in hindsight, there were all these heavy jazz musicians there. Like, uh, I don't know if you know Ben Street, the bass player. Yeah. Uh, so Ben taught bass and George Garzon was there, the sax player. Yeah. And uh, there was a guy from uh, LA. Well, he used to be in the studio scene, uh, Chuck Finley. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there was really heavy musicians there and uh I, but i like even at that time i was i really was not a jazz fan like i did i uh, like playing rock music um, uh. and the, you know it just but i knew that i, I love playing music and to me it seemed like the best musicians were jazz musicians so i knew at that point i really kind of wanted to go to school for music and so that's that's you know there's a, a guy at that jazz camp who actually his name was izzy rudnick um who came from north texas and he he was like yeah you should check out the school so i did and that's where i ended up going to school but like as you know north texas is really not known for kind of i mean there it's changed over the years but it, back when i went it was not really known so much for modern jazz as much as it was for churning out like really great readers you know mm. people that could read music really well not to say that, the, I mean, there was many, you know, fan, like Mark Johnson came out of there, like fantastic. I know, tons of guys. Yeah, yeah. Who, who came out of there. But um, the reputation of the school was, you know, developing that that craft of reading. And, yeah, uh, yeah. So, you know, I spent four, well, actually more than four years. I spent, uh, geez, really about six or seven years there doing my undergrad, master's. And... You know, I, I just wanted to kind of further my career and, and uh, I, I don't know, it's like I over time, I developed a love for jazz, like, and that was really when I was in school, like, you know, I didn't start playing the upright till exclusively till, or not exclusively, but as my primary instrument, yeah, until I was uh, about 25. Um, mm. And you know, it was around that time I really kind of got interested in the Bill Evans trio. And, and that was, I started to play that kind of interactive trio type jazz. And I really, that's when I kind of fell in love with the music. Um, but then it's like, you know, I, I made the venture out to LA at first under the guise of doing a doctorate at USC. Yeah, and I, I don't know as though I really wanted to do a doctorate, but I just wanted to move to LA. And I was like, well, this is a, you know, I had a, my mentor and teacher at North Texas, Lynn Seaton was like, man, you should, you know, just apply for this, uh, you know, the, try to get into USC and, <laughs> and uh, go out there. And, and so I did and got accepted and went out there, you know, it's a, and, and it was great for me because I was studying with John Clayton and yeah. like, uh, he was, you know, still is kind of one of my heroes. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I was there for, uh, I mean, it was kind of an incredible time there too. There's some really great musicians there. Um, and <clears throat> so I was at USC and, uh, 
uh, studying with John, and it, the, the kind of the pivotal thing that happened to me was that uh, I like I spent one semester there. You know, I was doing my doctorate, and I, 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 to be honest, Kathy, I, I didn't enjoy the classes I was taking. I was like, this is just, uh, this is not fun. Yeah, <laughs> this is not. So were they musical or were they oh, yeah. kind yeah, of they more were, analytical? They, no, they were, you know, I had a couple of teachers that I really liked. I had a uh, choral teacher. She was, um, she were, I can't remember her name, but she, she was part of the San Francisco opera hmm. or something but she was brilliant and yeah. and i loved that class and uh and then i had another class with this i had like i had to take all these kind of classes um that were kind of barrier classes because like i didn't test out of them so i you know i, I had to take like a an orchestration class and and the teacher in that class was brilliant too and and that was fun but then there was like a bunch of other classes that were just to me just garbage and uh you know, like uh, theories of education and like stuff I just was, <laughs> was not really interested in. Yeah. And I, I think for certain people that, you know, they're very, they, it would yeah. be great, but uh, not for me. And so the pivotal thing that happened was uh. over my winter break that first year, I I went on a tour in Japan for a couple of weeks, or I guess it's three weeks. And it was with a bunch of musicians that I used to play with in Dallas. Yeah. And so they had arranged this tour um, and so we went over to Japan and it was a blast. It was so much fun. You know, it's like we we're playing every night and then, uh, you know, going around the country, seeing all these, you know, yeah. different sites and stuff. And, and, uh, and so I got, you know, after break, I, I got back to school and I remember I had my, my first lesson with John Clayton and he's like, so how was your break? And I was like, <laughs> man, it was so, it was great. Went to Japan. I started. I was just like, you know, really turned excited. on. Yeah, yeah. And he and he just looked at me. He's like, it's like, man. He's like, you don't need to be doing this. <laughs> and uh, and I was like, what? What do you mean? He's like, he's like, you should just be out there playing, you know. And uh, I was like, I think he's right. And you know, I continued. I I finished out that second semester. But to be honest, Kathy, it's like most of the time, like I would uh, scour the halls. And at this time, uh, you know, Tigran Hamasian, yeah, he was going he was going to USC at the time. So oh. I would scour the halls and I just look for him. And then I just <laughs> he would always be like in the practice room and I just go yeah. and play with him. And yeah. like to me, that was like that was the most fun. <laughs> like I just because he was so brilliant, you know, and I learned just from playing with him. But um after that semester, I, yeah, I made the decision. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to try this playing music for a while. And, uh, <laughs> and so I did, you know, and, and I dropped out and, uh, and then I just started, you know, as we all do, I think when we're starting out, I just started taking every gig that came my way, you know? Uh, and I think, uh, you know, it's like, I don't know, some of the gigs were, garbage some of them were terrible like i remember doing a uh 40 <laughs> six hour gig at this place I, I don't know if it's still there called the lemon tree <laughs> oh yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> it was horrible but but you know it's like you just kind of pay your dues and you know i remember on that gig i met some people and they're like oh yeah you know maybe you'd be a good fit for this recording session we're doing you know and uh, and then it kind of just branched out from there and and then another thing that happened to me, and um, I, I feel like I'm, if, if I'm talking too much, just jump in and be like, hey. that's all right. You can talk for as long as you want. And then, you know, when you stop, I'll say something or I, I might interrupt. <laughs> it's like a, like a conversation. <laughs> um, but yeah, another kind of pivotal thing that happened to me was somebody introduced me to uh, to Matt Otto. And oh. like, I was, uh, you know, Matt, he was at the time, I think five years, five, six years. Well, I mean, still five or six <laughs> years older than me. Right. And, uh, he was playing, he had his own group uh -huh. and they kind of invited me out to play with them. And I did, and I loved the music and it was really different music from what I had been playing. And, and, uh, you know, a lot of odd meters and, and kind of real modern harmonies and, and, uh, and I really enjoyed it. And so it was he and 
Jason Harnell and this guitarist. Uh, Jamie? No, this was not Jamie. This was not Jamie Rosen. This was Joel uh, Peliquin. Okay. Yeah, at the time. And oh. uh, and so, yeah, we, you know, we would go out to Jason Harnell's house and play all these tunes that Matt had written. And, and, uh, and yeah, and so that kind of, again, that opened up a whole new world of players to me. Then I started playing with like Joe Bag a bunch and, uh, you know, it just kind of branched out from there. And yeah. uh, that, that kind of, that, you know, to make a long story even longer, I, uh, I think that's how I developed a kind of a love for modern jazz is, yeah. is by, by way of Through that their... route. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting road, you know, this whole lifetime of music. I mean, like you, I came from a musical family. My dad was a sax player. I had two twin sisters, uh, four years older than me, and they both sang. One played piano, hmm. so we, you know, we grew up singing. Then working with my dad. My mom had been a singer, so of course she was for it. You know, I mean, on and on. I was always in the school plays and the orchestra. I played flute and. I, then I went to Berkeley for flute because they didn't have voice at the time, but I was still a singer. And then I moved to San Francisco for a minute and then came to LA and I was always working. I was just like you. I just took every everything that came up. I had a, actually a two year weekly gig at a place called the two dollar bills in Hollywood. And uh, they paid to each musician who showed up, they paid $5 and a meal. <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine. And But I learned a lot, actually. I learned how to deal with people who said, I don't go out of the house unless it's, you know, $75 or whatever. I learned how to deal with that, you know, and, um, and who to call. And also, I learned my charts really well. I started writing at that time. I mean, one time... The, the band was trumpet and drums, you know, <laughs> and me, you know, and um, so, yeah, and then, you know, God, so many at that time, too, this was like, uh, it's probably um, the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, that was a time when it was prolific, the gigs were prolific, you know, there mm. was the jazz gigs, and then there was casuals and uh club gigs i mean we def we worked like 10 gigs a week you know and yeah. sometimes two casuals you know on a saturday and two on a sunday we were working a lot and uh so it was a lot of learning you know and things like i remember this whose name i can never remember this guy's name i don't know why he's kind of he was a famous kind of stride player who lived in LA and I was on a casual with him and I was the first set I was desperately trying to match him and it was horrible I just I was hating it and on the break I just thought you know what screw it I'm just I'm just gonna sing how I sing magic it was magic and so that so I had lessons like that along the way because where else do you get a lesson like that? You have mm -hmm. to be in that situation, right? Mm -hmm. And then, um, I mean, f my own listening, not my dad's listening, you know, right? Because I grew up, so I listened to his music. But my own listening had like Miles and the Modern Jazz Quartet and George Shearing. And um, actually just listening to you and seeing you play in the trio situation and and hearing how you said you went oh bill evans trio yeah that's nice you it resonated with you i think that that stuff resonated with me too the miles the modern jazz quartet you know it was there it was intimate and there was space and beautiful harmonies and rhythmic playing and I definitely followed that path. And I even remember in college, I decided whether I was going to go to the Woodstock path or the jazz path, you know, because I it was so present at that time. Um, so, yeah, it's just um, the choices that you make. And even after you make the choices, you know, things come up, situations come up. Um, 
I mean, for a singer too, it's always like, do I sing just the standards straight the way that, you know, everybody knows them or can I jump around and make it alternative and, um, are people tolerant of that? Do they like mm-hmm. it? Is there a small crowd who's interested in that? Or, or uh, do I do what what's true for me and then just not really care, you know? And sometimes what's true for me is, is a simple melody, you know, of a standard, you know? Just depends on the situation and the musicians. Um, do you... Do have you been through ideas like that as well? Yeah, I, I, I really, uh, the thing that stood out to me in what you just said is, is uh, kind of trying to be authentic, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so yeah. what, and I, I think this is something I've come to later in life. Like, yeah. uh, um, I'll give you an example. I was actually just talking, you know, I teach here at Moorhead. And so I was talking to my class and you were talking about some of this, like about lessons learned on gigs, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think along the way, you learn what you can do and what you can't do, what you can yeah. tolerate and what you can't tolerate. And, <laughs> you know, and one <laughs> of the things for me is, is like, I kind of wear my heart on my sleeve. Like, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of honest to a fault, you know? And um, so I had this experience where, uh, I w- this is when I was living in Korea. I was I lived in Korea for three years. I was teaching at a university over there, and uh, this is right after I was in LA. And you know, I got hired to do a lot of different things over there, and and you know, some good, some not so good. But um, I remember the first year I was there, I got hired to do. Somebody called me up to do. Uh, it was like a smooth jazz gig, and um, and I was like, yeah, sure, you know, and, and it paid a lot of money. And I was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I can, you know, I'm a competent musician. I'm pretty sure I can do this. And it was on electric bass and I'm, you know, I play electric. And... So anyways, I, I went and I did this gig and, and, um, and I realized very quickly, like it, when we were rehearsing, I'm like, this is not for me. Like, and it was, it was not for me because, um, because I couldn't pretend to enjoy what I was playing (laughs) like and and don't get me wrong Kathy like I have friends that uh you know play smooth jazz and they love it yeah and they're good at it and they're and they're brilliant musicians yeah you know like but I found in that situation for myself like I did not like it like I didn't like what I was playing and therefore it was like I couldn't put a smile on my face while I was playing it because it was completely in it was inauthentic and so um you know having that experience was was really good for me because I I understood like then you know when people call me to do that well I don't think anybody called me after that <laughs> but but uh but I realized like if somebody ever called me again to do it I I could, I would just have to say no, because um, (laughs) it was not something I could do authentically. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, there's plenty of things I do that I'm not good at that, uh, that I'm authentic with. Like here in Kentucky, um, occasionally I get the chance to play bluegrass and I love that music. I'm not very good at it. It is a great music. I'm not very good at it though. Like, because I don't know the rap, you know, but but man, I'll play that, you know, yeah. it's like, if you give me a chance, give me a shot, I'll <laughs> sit in and play it. But, you know, and I can do that authentically, but um, not very well, but authentically. It's kind of like, a, it's like a, bluegrass for me is like surfing. I'm terrible at it, but I have a blast every time I do it. <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> I wanted to say that, uh, John Pru is here and he said hi. Oh, tell him hello. <laughs> John Pru, <laughs> hello. Alan Booker, Mike Balling, Dan Davila is here. He's sharing your uh, guest credits and discography and also a few um, gigs so we'll, we can watch those. And Toby Simmons and from Japan, Hiroki Hay- Hayashi. Good morning, Ohio. Um, and Nora, hi, Nora. So, um, yeah, 
um, you know, now is a good time to play something. So I have from Dan, I have a baked potato with Jason Harnell and oh. Larry Coots. Oh, Coots. <laughs> Let's do that. I think that would be fun. Yeah, Kunz. He's he's just been playing everywhere lately. He's so great. He's, so is Jason. Yeah. So yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it, we have a uh, an embarrassment of riches here. It's totally. Yeah. <laughs> true, right? Totally. Okay. Here we go. That was a few years ago. Look at how young everybody looks. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Oh yeah, 2012. Yeah.
really beautiful damn you know i mean when you can listen <laughs> when you can listen to a a, um, a ballad with that instrumentation and not want to turn it off <laughs> <laughs> you know it's good that was really beautiful i think that was uh one of jason's yeah i think it was it's called lullaby yes yeah wow and Larry, I mean, to me, it's oh. just, he's, he's just the best. You know, he's such a deep player, you know, it's like. He's the king of taste. Mm -hmm. he, just... he never plays anything that doesn't need to be there, you know? Yeah, yeah. And his, his sound is really distinct. I also have loved his, uh, his rhythmic play, his comping. You know, he's an unusual comper. He doesn't comp on the, on the kind of normal beats or down, down strokes. Or, I can't remember right now, but he, he does some other kind of comping. It's I have a uh, funny painting. Larry story. <laughs> you do? <laughs> <laughs> so the first time I played with Larry, uh, <laughs> it was actually with Matt Otto, Jason Harnell, uh, Joe Bag, and yeah, and Larry and I. And it was at this <laughs> weird place in... Riverside, I think the place was called Mario's oh, or something. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember a place out there. And so, yeah, we all had to drive like an hour and a half. Well, <laughs> who knows how long in traffic. Uh, but anyways, it's my first time playing with Larry. And so we were, I remember we just started playing like all the things you are. And, you know, I had never, I had no idea how Larry played or anything. And so we started playing. And Larry, just like you said, he was comping, but he does it in kind of an odd way where he um, plays on off beats. Yeah. And he does these kind of groupings of five and sometimes groupings of seven. Yeah. And, but he's very precise, you know, and he totally knows what he's doing. But anyways, we're playing along and, and I'm listening to Larry and I'm like, oh, man. It's a damn shame. He doesn't know where he is, you know. Oh. <laughs> I, was just like, I, I was like, oh man, it's gonna be a rough night, you know. And, and then it's like I got like one course in and I realized I'm like, oh my God, no, he's he knows what he's doing. Like I'm the one who's you know not playing up to class here. <laughs> oh God, I know that feeling. That's a that's a funny feeling, isn't it? It's like, yeah. I've I've gotten that a lot with piano players who don't know me. You know, they start playing with me, especially in a duo, and they start adjusting. And it's like, don't adjust, you know? And definitely yeah. do not play the melody with me. You know, I'm I know, believe me, you know. <laughs> but yeah, that's really <laughs> that's very funny. <laughs> I can totally understand that. Yeah, He's such a brilliant player. He's. Oh. Uh, I don't know if you heard um, the record I did. I'll have to send you a copy with uh, he he and Josh, and me. Oh, Josh Nelson. Yeah. Oh, that, I bet that's great. Wow, they they just are so beautiful together. Oh my God. Woo. Yeah. Yeah, there's a real love affair there. It's really beautiful, and also he and Aunt Maro. Crazy. Oh, Ruiz. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That that's crazy too. Yeah. Crazy good. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant players out there. Well, actually, Kathy, it's funny. It's like you, you know, just playing uh, the last clip there. I, 
I mean, it really makes me miss Los Angeles. There are so many players that you develop relationships with. And then, you know, when you're removed from the scene, it's like, oh, man, when you hear them, you're just like, oh, yeah, I, I really miss that, you know. Yeah. Um, do you do you have players who you're playing with? In, no, I just I just play by myself. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have. Yeah, there's uh, there's some really great players around here. I'm really fortunate uh, at the school I'm at. There's uh, my colleague. He and I kind of run the jazz department. His name's Glenn Ginn. He's a guitarist um, and he's a he's a really great player. And, and uh, we do actually a regular gig here at the local brewery. Um, so we do every <laughs> Thursday, we play down at the brewery and it's either Glenn and I like guitar and bass, or we also play with this drummer in town and he's a great drummer. His name's Nick Diedrichson. Um, oh. So we do that. And then uh, I stay pretty active in kind of the area, like, you know, a couple hours from here. Uh, like there's some people in Louisville that I play with occasionally, a great uh, alto player. His name's Jacob Duncan. And, mm. um, and then in Cincinnati, there's some really fine players up there too. Yeah. So, they, you know, there's like, uh, there's some, some little pockets. Of, and actually, in, I should say in Lexington too. Lexington is about an hour away from here. There's some really, this guy, Raleigh Daly and Paul Dethridge on drums. They, you know, great mm. players around here. Um, yeah. So I, I still get a, a chance to, um, you know, develop rapport with, with people around here and, and, you know, still play the craft. And, you know, I do, uh, there's some projects I do because of, you know, because of the job that I'm in. Um, I, you know, a couple years ago, I applied for an internal, uh, for a grant and uh, was able to get the grant. And then I, you know, wrote some music for a big band and had it recorded. And I'm going to do that again this year. I just uh, put in for another grant. And this summer I will record uh, a bunch of my own compositions with a non -at. So, um, so yeah, it's like, I'm still trying to be creatively active and, uh, you know, with playing and writing. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. You're, you're, I was thinking you're working full time, right? So, and then this yes, period yeah. of, so you actually, uh, gave us th two hours of your work time probably. Well, I don't, I don't do much work here. No, just kidding. <laughs> no. no, I, uh, well, I, I do, you know, it's like a lot of university, the, the benefit of this job is that, you know, I, I do have some flexibility with it. Right. Like, uh -huh. so I can, if, if say I do have a gig, uh, I can, you know, rearrange my classes or my lessons. Like right now I teach, I think I have eight lessons that I teach. Uh, and then I do, um, I teach a, I teach a big band, so I do a, an ensemble class, and then I teach a jazz arranging class, and I teach a music technology course. Um, is that it? I think that's it this semester. Um, so yeah, it's like I have my hands full with it, but I also have some flexibility with that schedule. So yeah. I think normally, like Tuesday's my kind of light day, so it kind of worked out perfectly. Oh, cool. Um this is just kind of, this is out of, out of the flow of what we're talking about, but um, what, who is, uh, did you have one particular kind of mentor on the base um, or, you know, like uh, not necessarily that you, who you met, you know, was it listening to particular record that blew your socks off or you know yeah. that kind of thing well um i'll approach that question a couple of ways uh i think um yeah so kind of the the blow your mind experiences that um people some musicians have like for me uh the first musician that i listened to that i was just like kind of like blown away on bass by was jocko Pastorius. I was just like, wow. <laughs> I, and at first I was just like, I don't know what he's doing, but it is sure is good. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I remember when I was 16, I think. Uh, no, I was even younger than that, maybe 14. Uh, I had a guitar teacher who went to Berkeley and 
he was trying to teach me bass and like he didn't really know anything about bass but he was just like he knew kind of what to give me to listen to and he's like I, he's like you should go out and get this guy's recording and and this would have been you know i can't remember when that that recording was 78 or something yeah something like that yeah yeah so i mean this would have been like 87 or something that he turned me on and he's like you should go get that jaco pastorius recording and i was like okay so i remember i went and got it and uh and listened to it and i was just like i don't understand what is happening here. but <laughs> he's doing things to the bass that i didn't even know were possible and i you know one of the things that, that he played is of course donna lee and like he, <laughs> yeah and i was just like there's a couple things that, like for me i was like i don't understand bebop language at all but what he's doing in the bass was just so incredible to me i was just, and he had this other tune portrait of tracy on there that uh, where he's using all these harmonics and stuff and and I was just so enthralled with it. I just, it just kind of blew me away. And so that was kind of pivotal for me. Um, and then, like I said, the Bill Evans trio, Scott LaFaro was really kind of a huge influence on me transitioning from electric bass to upright. Like once I heard Scott LaFaro, I was like, man, this is what I want to do. This yeah. is like the, what he's doing. I want to do that. Yeah. And and the way he had kind of an equal voice in Bill Evans's group, you know, mm, and, yeah. and I just enjoyed that so much. Was and it then, his? Uh, was it okay. his? Was it his musical? Uh, let's see. Was it the what he played? Like the lines he played, the rhythms. Was it what he left out? Was it? Um, I think it was that? all of the above. Yeah, like. Yeah. I think for, for me, it was so radically different from like your standard Paul Chambers walking bass. Right, right. And, and it seemed, and, and what was odd about this, Kathy, is I felt like, I like when I started playing the upright, I, like that type of playing was more natural to me than walking. Like I've always felt like when I was walking, I was just like, I don't know what I'm doing, like, but I, I'm just duh, duh, and this is boring. And then, like, when I heard LaFaro, I was like, oh, I didn't know you could do it this way. Yeah. And uh, now, that being said, you really shouldn't do it that way all the time. <laughs> you know, it's like, that was a pretty special framework, like the Bill Evans trio, you know. And I, I'll, I'll t I got to tell you this story. This is hilarious. Um, so... I kind of was hellbent on playing like LaFaro for a while while I was in, at North Texas in college. I was like, man, I just want, I, this is how I want to play. So every time I play with anybody, I'm going to play this way. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, some piano trio people loved it, you know. Um, but there, there was one time when I was at North Texas and uh, like they had this thing called the jazz lecture series. They, they would get... Um, lecturers, guest lecturers to come in and play. And if you're lucky, sometimes you get to play with them. And so uh, they asked me to play a couple of times. And, and one of the times it was with Benny Green and, you know, brilliant, like bebop, piano, like Oscar Peterson yeah. style pianist, yeah. right? Yeah. And so anyways, um, you know, we were, is like me and the drummer and Benny Green, we were playing trio and it was in front of like all of my peers and colleagues and, uh -huh. uh, in this auditorium and like you know we played one tune and and he was like you know benny was like yeah he's like yeah it's cool you know and so <laughs> then you know he's like let's play another let's see called stella by starlight and i was thinking i felt comfortable at that point i'm like oh okay i'm gonna do my scott lafaro thing you know and and so we we started playing and like <laughs> i was doing my scott lafaro thing and benny green just turned he just turned around he's like he's like give me a funny face and and then like finally he just yelled out He's just like, give me four, give me four. <laughs> he, he just went, because I mean, that's how, like, I was not playing to the situation. I was just playing, you know, to yeah. try to yeah. manhandle like everything into, to fit my way. It, it yeah. was not appropriate in the moment, you know? Yeah. It's like, yeah. if you're going to serve the music, then, you know, then play to Benny Green. <laughs> um, yeah. But that yeah, reminds was, me of how Charlie Hayden plays, right? Charlie mm -hmm. Hayden plays Charlie Hayden, right? And um, I've I've actually heard musicians say they don't like how he plays. 
I I like his playing, but oh, he's brilliant. Yeah. But I understand what? they're they're wanting the four, and that's not yeah. Charlie Hayden, right? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I think there's you know, uh, like in my situation playing with Benny Green, it's like he's the he's he's the mentor, right? Yeah. Like it's he's the, he's kind of the, and I'm there to serve, you know. Yeah. And uh, I think with Charlie Hayden, though, it's like you hire Charlie Hayden because he's Charlie <laughs> Hayden. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, he's yeah, yeah, he's he, kind of the senior, the senior player, right? He's well, one of know, my favorites. Ugh. I use a I use a Schofield tune when I teach scatting and just various things. Um, there's a Schofield tune. I forget which one it is. I think it's might be on one of the groove records that Schofield did and Charlie's playing on it. And um, <laughs> so John takes a solo, you know, guitar solo, right? Great guitar solo, right? You know, a lot of notes, but great. You know, I loved Schofield is one of my favorites. And then it's Charlie's turn. What does he do? He plays whole notes. <laughs> and it's so perfect. You can't yeah. argue with it. It's perfect, you know, and that's a great example of serving the music, right? You, it's not about you and showing off your chops. It's about serving, serving the music, you know, sir. <laughs> it's great. I love it. <laughs> He's got a recording. Uh, I can't remember what recording it is, but like, I always play it for my students where he, um, he's playing body and soul and he just starts he starts out with a solo like it's yeah. a bass solo yeah and it's all like in the real low register with half notes and it's but it's so beautiful and lyrical <laughs> yeah and it's like it's a bass player playing bass notes but it's just it's like the best solo ever you know and i i think as a younger player it's like a lot of times i, I know I, i'll speak for myself it's like as a younger player I wanted nothing of Charlie Hayden because I was like, uh, he's, he's got no chops, you know, like I don't hear any chops. Right. But then as an older player, you're like, nah, that's the real deal. Like, because it's so, it's, as we were talking earlier, it's so authentic. And yeah. it's like, he's really singing through the instrument. He's not relying on any, he's not relying any, on any, uh, you know, kind, kind of, of the rules or, or something. Yeah. 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 He's really um, following the line. Yeah. Like it's, it's not like anything preconceived. It's in a lot of ways, it's like, a, I mean, it's similar to like how Lee Konitz plays, but on, on the bass, you know. You know what I, you should check out the uh, interview yesterday with Mark Dresser. I think you'd really enjoy it. Um, but uh, what struck me, I was playing a few different things. And uh, I mean, I guess he's known as an avant-garde player. Um, and he's, he's really an incredible player. Forget the quote. It was it was some really interesting quote. It's like saying saying Mark Dresser plays good is like saying Albert Einstein can do math. <laughs> 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 it's great. But yeah. anyway, it was really interesting. Even the, uh, he played a cut, you know, from his new solo up record. I, it was amazing, actually. I I wasn't sure if he was doing it all like. At, at once like live or if he was doing overdubs or if he had a loop or um and he did he just it was just live hmm. and um but what intrigued me about him was um uh, that the music that he was how he played was not um intangible it was very haveable relatable um hmm. you know you had affinity for it i did you know uh, it wasn't like, oh gosh, I'm going to be falling asleep. It wasn't anything like that. And it, and it was also interesting. I, I, there were some people uh, here now listening who listened yesterday. But what was funny too was when we were playing things that had a lot of space, it was still time, like, but very space, you know, not like everything obviously grooving. He was, he was dancing, like listening to it. And it was so it's like, oh, you hear the groove, you hear and feel the mm. groove. And even though we're not really seeing it, obviously, it's still there, you know, mm -hmm. it's really interesting. So 
and especially for bass players. I mean, I remember when I first realized that bass was the timekeeper in the group. Mm -hmm. And that really was very significant to me, you know. And um, especially as a singer, you know, singing students always they listen to the drummer, I think. Yeah, and, the, yeah. and of course the drummer has to have good time, but it's really the bass who's the timekeeper. And when they get that, you know, everything is magic. But um, so you would think that the bass is not controlling the groove, but definitely contributing a mm. lot to the reality of the groove, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I kind of think of the bass as, as the as the anchor, you know, uh -huh. like it is it is the groove and you know, it it should be kind of the fixed groove. Yeah. Uh, and then the drummer is yes, of course they're a timekeeper too, as well as piano or guitar. Yeah, player. yeah, everybody has but, to have the time. Yeah, actually, yeah, everybody's responsible for the time, but like we're kind of like, you know, if there's a strong wind we're the ones who need to <laughs> kind of keep our place. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, I like I um, we're also, you know, it's like with in, in most groups, I mean, I guess drums to the, are the same to this extent, but like we're playing all the time, you know, like uh, whereas other instruments can kind of take a break. Uh, generally, the bass player, aside from like when the the drums are playing it's like um we're playing the entire time yeah. and so therefore like that thump 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 or the pulse you know the groove it has to be um central you know yeah. it has to be that that's our job and it's like even when you know i'm gonna get into teaching mode now but like uh when i'm teaching my students like the bass players i'm always teaching them like it's more important to have the pulse that like the pitches are less, they're not very important. I mean, I don't want to say they're not very important, but no, yeah, but, the, but, but the like pulse you can get away more... with, oh yeah, you can get away yeah. with murder. Like I could play a bunch of nonsense yeah. uh, as long as I have that pulse. You know? Yeah. Um, I remember, I remember what made me realize that the bass was, was the guy. Um, you'll like this. So at the old Catalinas in, in, LA and people on here who have been on here for the last two years have heard me tell this, but um, I went to hear uh, Kenny Kirkland, Jeff Tane Watts, and Dave Carpenter. Did you ever know oh, Dave yeah. Carpenter? I didn't know him personally, but I mean, he was, knew I was him. there when he was around. Yeah. Yeah. Great bass player. And so that was super interesting. At first, I was like, I hated it. It was like, what the hell is going on? Because Kenny was on the back side of the beat. Um, Jeff <laughs> drums was on the front side of the beat, right? Uh -huh. He's definitely, and Dave, finally, I got it. Dave was the middle mm. and he was holding everything together. And that's when my mind just totally got blown. <laughs> you know, I just totally got that expanded, uh, you know, kind of teeter-totter thing that was happening that was centered with the bass. It was great, really. Yeah, I loved that. I mean, I think probably I had an inclination towards that too, like when I was in college, you know, I, lo I loved Weather Report. And I was yeah. fascinated that everybody was doing something different, you know, but they were all tied in to this, you know, common middle, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the most delicious things about music that is possible. And it can be ha had in, in any genre, you know, it depends on the players, I guess, right? And how they're playing, right? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and I, I, I uh, like, I love kind of that push and pull between the bass and drums. Like, yeah. so, to me, that's, that's kind of the central thing. So, like, um, and yes, you know, you'll get it with instrumentalists or not instrumentalists, like the bass and drums are not instrumentals, uh, but uh, <laughs> you'll get it with like horn players and piano players too. But like yeah. particularly between the bass and drums, it's like, um, right. 
you know, some of my favorite pairings, like my favorite pairing of all time is, is uh, Ray Brown and Ed Thigpen. Huh. And like Ray is like way over here. And Ed Thigpen is like trying to hold him back because he knows if he doesn't hold him back, like Ray's going to go, what? He's gonna, the <laughs> tempo is just going to keep going. Yeah. And like pretty much every recording you listen to of the Oscar Peterson group with Ed Thigpen and Ray Brown, like they they almost all speed up and it's so great like it sounds so great because of that energy of ray tugging at at, at big <laughs> and, and you know it's like i think of some of my favorite drummers to play with and there's that push and pull too and then so, you know it's like sometimes you'll fit in with a drummer it's like i think of uh you know remember mark ferber i mean of course you know absolutely mark, yeah. i love mark like, ferber mark is like a really kind of on top drummer uh -huh. And like uh, one of my like one of my hands down favorite like rhythm sections to listen to was uh, Mark and Darek Oles. <laughs> like, and what's funny about them is they both like play on top, and so like you'll get the the whole band kind of moving forward with them, but the energy is just it's great, you know. It's like <laughs> so I don't think there's like a right or wrong. It's like you could have you know, uh, a drummer playing way back here and the bass player kind of really pulling him. You know, it's like uh, when you listen to like Jeff Hamilton's trio, Jeff plays a little bit on the backside and mm -hmm. then, you know, I guess Kristoff, I I, th I don't know who it yeah, is. Yeah, Kristoff, uh-huh. Uh, would pull, you know, pull a little bit. And I think Jeff probably got that from playing with Ray too, you know. Yeah, but, and Tamir, um, I think, plays kind of on the front, I think. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember yeah. really on, on this particular point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I remember there was a, dr a bass player here years ago uh, named Eric Von Essen, who was a really, really musical guy and just one of the favorites at that time, you know. Um, and he, I remember this one gig that I had, I had uh, two, two guitars, because, you know, I have to do different stuff. <laughs> two guitars, Eric, Paul Krybik, oh, yeah. uh, who's kind of, you know, he can play different styles, but on this particular one, he was kind of straight ahead. And um, it was a solo, and I was supposed to come back in, but I didn't because Eric kind of opened this door for the band musically and led everybody into this space that was, it was perfect. I just didn't even, I didn't even want to mess with it. You know, it was just beautiful. That's kind of an unusual thing, I think, uh, you know, hearing bass players, like, are they, they're, they're, I, especially in the group that we're talking about, the, the tribe that we're talking about, you know, they're definitely even with everybody, you know, it's not like they're something in the back, but leading is kind of, it's, it's a little different, I think, for bass. I think generally we're sidemen. You know, like I think in general, a bass player is not is not going to be the leader of the group. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, there's. I don't mean to say that we can't lead the group into it, like kind of like what you're talking about with Eric. Um, like, yeah, there's times when I'm like, you know, yeah, I I'm hearing something, and you know, let's try to take it here. You know, yeah. And you know, if if you're playing with a real flexible group that can do that, it's it's awesome. You know, yeah. it's it's really uh, one of the most fun things to do, but in terms of like our function in a group or, uh, not our function in a group, but, uh, in terms of what we normally do, it's like, we're, we're, we're normally, um, uh, uh, a side man, you know, that's like, that's kind of our gig. And I mean, to, uh, it's the most comfortable gig for me. It's like, I love being a side man. It's like yeah. so much fun. It's like so little pressure, <laughs> like, <laughs> to get me out of my comfort zone it's like i like if i'm leading a gig or if i am uh the leader of a group uh that's that's less of my comfort zone that's less in my wheelhouse you know yeah um, but um but i do love to you know kind of uh musically take people down a dark corridor occasionally <laughs> <laughs> uh he admits it <laughs> oh anthony yeah you're right it's yeah he's making comments on what we're talking about he he thinks it's also how you feel the quarter note because it's like the mother of the bar yeah it's true yeah. uh-huh 
Dan put up something. I don't know if you ever played with Sam Most and a bunch of people. Oh, I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I think uh, oh, we can we can watch something else too. I mean, it doesn't matter. We can watch whatever whatever you want to do. Like I, I thought you I think you put together that gig, right, Kathy, the one where I played with Sam most. Oh, let me see. <laughs> Let's oh, yeah, I think that was at. This is the great Sam most. Yeah. Yeah. Wait a minute. Hold on one second. Uh, yes, that is that is hysterical. I, I think that's I mean, the first time I first and only time I played with Sam. And is that Bob McChesney? Bob McChesney on trombone. Gary Fukushima. Gary Fukushima on piano. This was a little room near me called uh, More Art. And oh, yeah. um, so I created like a jazz series there. And um, did you know Bob and Calabria moved to Nashville? I No, I had no idea. When did they do that? About nine months ago. Oh, wow. And he built a he built a brand new studio in the bottom of his new house. Okay, well, that's good to know. He's like only four hours from me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, up oh, there, I am with short, short hair. Let's see. There's Sam, and there's Ryan. I wonder who's playing drums on this. I don't know if. Oh yeah, maybe. Yeah, let's see. Is it Trivet? No, I don't think so. Let's see. I'm trying to see if we shot the drummer. Uh, I don't know if we shot the drummer. Looks like you can see him right there. Uh, oh, there, there he is. Oh, it's Brian. Oh my God. That's so long ago. Yeah. We'll, we'll play one of these. <laughs> Sam was so brilliant. He was great. Ryan Doyle, yeah. No, no, do something, you know. <laughs> Sam was, he was, he was special. <laughs> yeah.
Does it say what year that's from? Yeah, uh, it is <clears throat> 2009. Okay. That was really nice, wasn't it? Oh, oh Sam's great. I forgot about Ryan Doyle. Where is he? Yeah. Where is he? I don't know where he is these days. Do you? I think he's still in Los Angeles. Yeah. I uh, I know he's good buddies with Joe Bag. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't think he plays as much, but uh, yeah, he's uh, yeah, he was a brilliant player. Talk about a kind of a Bill Evansy, you know, relationship. That band was like gorgeous, yeah. right? Yeah. And Gary Fukushima, I'm sorry. He's he's he's, <laughs> he's underrated, man. Yeah. He's, I always try and kind of push him up to the spotlight because he's he is a gorgeous player. Really yeah. amazing. Yeah, he's very humble too. It's very. like uh, yeah. it's like he I don't think he'd ever acknowledge how good he was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did a gig with him last week and <laughs> I actually recorded his solos. <laughs> I told him afterwards, I said, I recorded your solos. I'm going to take them down. And he, he laughed. <laughs> oh, Kathy, you know, you know, but uh, yeah, he's, I just love the way he thinks. We, we have this group called The Moment. I don't know if you ever heard that. So what happened was, Gar I, I wanted to do a gig at that Oyster Salt Bar. Oyster oh, Salt yeah, Bar. over in the uh, studio in city. the valley, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I asked Gary and he said, oh, let's let's get um, let's get Brad Dudes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so Gary and Brad Dudes. And then we somebody said, let's get Chuck Manning. And um, so <laughs> Gary, Brad Dudes and Chuck Manning, no bass player. So we went <laughs> and we played and then who should come in but the guitarist Jeff Richmond, who's an old friend of mine. And he's actually one of my favorite guitar players, kind of like a Schofield. And he said, can I sit in? So I said, sure. So the moment was born, right? So we had no bass player in that group. But Gary, you know, didn't play the standard left-handed bass, but he he took care of, you know, bass. And we recorded live at the Blue Whale. And every every time we get together, which isn't often, but it's the same relationship. You know, it's really oh, that's great. just yeah. a great relationship. And Gary just plays so amazing and the, the you know year after year when we would have a gig like we did brad dutz's series you know a few years back and even jeff richmond was smiling <laughs> <laughs> he's one of those guys who doesn't smile a lot on the gig but he was smiling at gary you know oh that's great yeah <laughs> he's really 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 good i've been having him come over actually every few weeks because um do you know John Leftwich? Uh, the bass player, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he and I are um, creating this No Net, speaking of No Nets, um, which we we actually played at Just Jazz, Leroy Downs' series in Hollywood. Um, we played there, and so now we're revisiting it. We're going to play a few gigs. We're going to uh, do some rehearsals and record in April. And... Um, it's really nice. John is a really good arranger and Gary's in the band. And um, so we're, uh, yeah, so Gary and I are getting together because I want to feel really, you know, super comfortable with the material, you know. So John uh, is arranging the non at material. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's really nice. Really nice. Yeah, he's, I love the way he thinks. It's really, mm. really good. And he and I are super old friends too. We've worked mm. on projects together. So yeah, but Gary Fukushima. Oh, he's the best. Yeah, he, he used really to is. play. We used to play a bunch with he for a while played in uh, Matt Otto's band. Oh, cool. Yeah, so we were uh, in playing cahoots. a lot together. Yeah, yeah, quite a bit. Yeah, you sounded great on that. Oh, that thanks. Yeah, thing we just watched. Yeah, it's so beautiful, solid, and beautiful. I remember uh, when I. I remember when I was teaching in Korea, like I had some flute players and they were asking me and they're like, Oh, you know, who, who should I listen to? I was like, you should listen to Sam most, <laughs> you know? And, yeah. Uh, I remember when I first yeah. heard Sam, I was uh, a waitress at Dante's when I first moved here, I was like 21 
and I and he was playing actually he was playing tenor and okay. which his tone was a, a little too airy for me you know on tenor mm. but it was very unique and like we were speaking you know authentic and it was Sam most playing it you know <laughs> mm-hmm. and but his flute playing was like and me I had been a flute player so it was like whoa wow and I had heard of Sam Mo through my dad, my dad, you know, cause he was a tenor player. And so, but, um, and Sam was just such a sweetheart and his brother, Abe. Um, but, um, was his brother a musician too? Oh yeah. He was an incredible, uh, clarinetist. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. I think Abe was slightly older than Sam and he very ensconced in jazz, the jazz world. Um, but, yeah and sam just such a character and such a he really lived in that um that ability to really uh kind of be the vehicle you know he he, he, i i mean think every time i ever heard him like he played a little piano he he sang yeah You, you must have heard him sing I remember him. Yeah, actually, I think on that gig he did some singing. Yeah, he was very comical, quirky. Yes, and you know. He also did uh, the thing where he sings while he plays. Yeah. 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 But his his flow always was there. It was always there. I I don't think I ever. And I have a book by him too. Of um, which now that I've seen that, it makes me want to bring out that book again. Um, lines, you know, just lines over changes um Mm. but just getting into the way he's he thinks you know it's just very very musical yeah like even listening to that recording it i was was struck by the way he he plays over bar lines you know so it's not like he's not you get to the top of the forum and he's starting a new phrase it's like he's playing all the way through until the line ends and and yeah it, it doesn't matter where he is like in the forum He's just yeah. playing in the moment. You know? Yeah, it's really beautiful. Um, speaking of in the moment, I'm I'm reading um, presently. I'm reading uh, Kenny Werner's second book. Oh, how is it? It's good. It's you know I was talking to I do this kind of Zoom hang with Stephen Nachmanovich and a few other people. Oh, the free play. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. I love that book. That's a great book. Totally. So free for me, and it sounds like for you, free play and effortless mastery were two books that friggin changed blew yeah. my mind open and both those guys after about 25 years wrote a second book so uh, nakmanovich's second book called? the second book it's called uh uh let's see i think it's called the art of the art of is i'll have to look for it yeah both of them it's really interesting i was telling this to the group yesterday um the second book definitely has it's almost like a continuation of the idea of this of the first book but where the first book was you know in this uh in this column or this you know corridor the second book is the same corridor but it's now it's it's doing this so it's Mm. it embraces um who it embraces their how their paths went and lessons learned and some new ideas on the lessons learned and but basically how it relates to the first idea you know Mm. It's, it's very interesting I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm enjoying it. I mean, I don't know if I can honestly enjoy the second books as much as the first books, because the first books, I was so not where they, where they were, you know? (laughs) Yeah. And, And it just blew my mind, both of those books. And I looked at them for years. I have these books, you know, as a lot of people do with markings, you know, like a Mm -hmm. Bible, you open it up and anywhere you open it, it's like they're talking to you, you know? Yeah. Um, But, 
I am enjoying it, but I just, I'm such a different person now. I've, I've been on that path for so long um, that it's, in, it's just, it's interesting. It's really interesting reading them, I have to say. Mm. Yeah, well, I just, yeah, I, I can relate to what you're talking about with uh, Werner's first book. Like, uh, I, that was kind of mind blowing for me too. I, I like when I read it, I, I just realized after reading it, like I was so concerned with playing the right notes all the time, you know? <laughs> right. And, and this kind of blew me away, this concept of like loving the notes that you're playing regardless of, uh, you know, just like not judging your not judging like <laughs> your uh you know what you're playing and, and uh yeah it was kind of really eye-opening and, and that, actually that was i think the first yeah i would say like that was the first my first kind of foray into meditation was with uh warner's book like he had those guided meditations yeah. and cds yeah you know, that came along with that and uh and i mean i you know later on kind of developed a different meditation practice but yeah um, but, but yeah and, and i remember at the time this would have been like early 90s or mid 90s maybe uh it was a very popular book in uh, at north texas like hmm. there was a lot of, we were everybody was reading it you know yeah and yeah it was, it was very i think pivotal for a lot of people's musical journey yeah um in reading this um you know i still I'm 68. I've been singing since I was born and professionally since I was 12. I went to college for music. I had a whole career of music and I still uh, work on my voice and my perspective, or I guess you could call it authenticity, um, while singing and, you know, work on it with I won't say a lot of worry, but, you know, attention, right? And at various times, because of my teacher or whatever, I'll realize that I'm like too too deep in the rabbit hole or whatever. But um, so I, when I was reading um, with, um, when I was reading with uh, this, uh, the Kenny Werner book, it was really cool. The last thing that I read was, something along the lines of filling up the space with you, with something from you. So instead of, because again, once again, surprising, it's just, I think I, think I should be above this, but <laughs> you know, when I sing a note, but now I'm immediately, I'm think I'm, qualifying it is it steady is it in tune how's the tone you know <clears throat> and so if i was thinking from him i tried it this morning actually i was just my voice broke and i i thought fine let's embrace that you know let's see what that is instead of oh my voice broke i'm you know i have to fix it you know and i have to say it was really <coughs> satisfying to do that i'm really looking forward to doing that more you know and even on a live gig i you know i want to get into that more and i i believe that when you do that that you actually are better you know you you do like also he was talking about the left and the right brain you know yes you do the work you know the technical work and you work on things that's you can't ignore that. But then there's the creative part of you that works together. And he's saying it needs to work together with that. And, <clears throat> and you have to be satisfied with that and create some kind of beauty, you know. Um, and that's, that's a great gift that we can give to listeners as musicians, you know. Um, and I guess, you know, it's kind of why we're doing it, right? To, to create something that's, that we can share that's satisfying and healing and helpful. And, you know, it's not all about, yeah, could you pat me on the back, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like, uh, 
you were talking about Charlie Hay Hayden earlier. Um, I like, I mean, he's got, he says that thing, I think it's in the Ken Burns series where he talks about like, our, or no, he didn't, no, this is not the Ken Burns. I think this is just something that he's known to have said. It's like his whole job as a musician, he felt like was to bring beauty into the world. Like, he's like, that is the absolute purpose of it, you know? And, uh, and you know, what Werner's talking about, what you're talking about, like, is, I mean, we're really kind of driven by our egos, I think. And, and like, you know, we can really get judgmental about the beauty we're bringing into the world. Like, is it right? Is it valid? Is it, you know, cause I mean, that's human, you know, and, uh, yeah, but that's one is. of the great things about getting older though, I think is that, um, I, I don't know. I, I think I'm a little less judgmental on myself. Like I'm like, eh, this is me, <laughs> you know, exactly. I, I still, I still occasionally get into the, you know, the headspace where, especially when I'm with, I tell you when it happens the most, Kathy is, uh, when I'm with people that I, uh, I look up to and respect and I'm like, you know, yeah. maybe even if there's a bit of fear, right? Like, yeah. and that's when I can get really ego driven and start like judging myself and, and even in those situations, if I can consciously somehow, if I can become conscious of what I'm doing, then I have a shot at, of kind of letting it go and just being like, eh, you know, no, I'm just playing music. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah, me too. That's exactly right. That's what happens. And uh, yeah, and and uh, thank you for saying that because um, I have a project that I've been trying to decide who to use for a particular spot in the band. And uh, I the, the group is a very weird, eclectic type of group. So I needed somebody to fit into that, but who's a great player. But it, you know, I remember my first husband, uh, you know, he was many things, but <laughs> he was, he was also wise and very, he was an artist. And in the very beginning, when I was starting to work here, you know, and I was stressing over this kind of thing, who to put together, you know, and he said, it's really actually about their personalities, you know, because, you know, if you get somebody on the same vibe, they're going to make music. And yeah, yeah. it was true. It was great. And I learned that time after time after time, you know, being thrust, as we were saying, being thrust into different situations, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. I think that we should listen to something else. I wonder where I can find... Um, find you again maybe i can find something are you do you think you have anything more recent yeah you know what you should uh you should look up let me see if i can find it but it's uh you should look up the rp rpm big band if you can find it there it yeah. is yeah uh either all across the country or yeah that's probably it's probably a good one. Okay. Is this the school? Uh, this is like a bunch of regional kind of professional musicians. Uh, and this is, yeah, there's a couple of kids from the university in the group. And, um, but why yeah, is, was, is it your band? Is it RPM? The RPM, Ryan Paul McGillicuddy Big Band. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know your middle name. Okay. <laughs>
Wow. That was really nice. Oh, thanks. Wow, this is, um, yeah, they must be super happy to be playing with you. <laughs> I feel the same way about them. Uh, yeah, there's like, there's some really fine musicians here. Um, I was lucky to get uh, all those people to together at one, t one time to, p to play that uh, music. Yeah. It's funny, it's like, uh, I mean, you've done a lot of recording sessions so you know how challenging it can be just to go in and do a recording session even under a, a non-constrained time frame but like the the time frame we had that day was we had about like i think it was from we started at like 11 a.m and we had until like 7 p.m and the band had never played the music so we had to rehearse it for and we'd spend about two, two and a half hours rehearsing. Then we took a break and then we just recorded it. We just did. And there was like, I think we did eight tunes. And uh, wow. yeah, I, I mean, they were troopers. Like they, they just plowed through it. And, you know, they were getting paid for it, but not very much. <laughs> it was <laughs> well, like, well, that's, the, that's the nature scale. of the big band too, right? The big, big yeah, band. it's not a very, yeah. uh, profitable okay. business the big right <laughs> but um yeah they were uh, it, i mean personally i learned a ton just because i was in the position of uh having to 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 run the rehearsal and run the recording session and so you had to kind of discard things like quickly like okay was that a good take okay can we move on you know and uh, do we need to stop this right now? Was that error so egregious that we need to restart, you know, yeah. and, and like things like that. And, mm -hmm. and so in addition, and I'm, I know you've been in this situation as a lot of musicians have, um, when you are the one that like whose charts it is and who <laughs> is running, you know, the rehearsal and everything is kind of dependent upon you and you're playing at the same time, you, it's a very different experience than just playing. Like yeah. if you're just playing, it's like, ah, it's, but this is like, you're listening to everything, you know, you're, it's almost like an out of body experience where you're, you're the observer and everything that is going on, you're taking it all in at once, you know, so. It's very interesting. And it's, I mean, I have actually stood back afterwards and said, I guess I'm a control freak because I really, <laughs> you know, I'm, I like, you know, like controlling everything, but you also, it's like any control you if you also like I noticed, for instance, the the sax player was leading the sax section. And so it's if you can give uh, I forget the terminology, but you give control to somebody else too. Uh, like you have to there's a balance you have to have the kind of personality. I guess not. I mean, I'm sure there's producers who want it their way and only their way and that's it. But if for somebody like us, probably who's, you know, like what you just described, the player, the writer in it with your friends and trying to make music, I think it's uh, helpful if you can stop your own chatter in your mind and listen to somebody else's opinion and consider that or listen to so if somebody says something and maybe the rest of the band says, yeah. I, th I agree, you know, and drop the ego part of it, right? Well, and you also, <laughs> you also have to navigate personalities too. Oh, yeah. There's personalities that, you know, we're musicians and we're all, we all got personalities. <laughs> <laughs> we certainly do. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's for sure. And that, and that's a real, that's a real growing thing for yourself too, you know? It is a learning experience, yeah. Yeah, how do you handle that? And I always say, you know, I have a very high tolerance level, but <laughs> I do have, there is the top. You There's can't reach it, you know? <laughs> There's an outer boundary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, push and you will get there. And then, <laughs> and then you'll see somebody who you don't know, you know, but um, yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting. Uh, we're so lucky to have music as our life teacher, you know, mm. because it has so many beautiful things about it, you know, that, you know, but it's definitely, we're not 
<laughs> just because we're playing music doesn't mean we're not <laughs> we're not learning the lessons you know oh yeah well i mean you know you hit on it it's like i i always feel so lucky to to be doing what i do you know yeah it's like uh we didn't uh, do this for a house in the hills you know it's it's got to be something internal you know it's like something that you have to do and uh and man it's like oh i am so grateful for for, you know, it's, it's like, I always put this to students. Like it's kind of not every gig is great. You know, this Kathy, yeah. like, you know, uh, but you can almost inevitably, almost on every gig, you can find a moment of greatness, right? Like, so there's it, and that's, that makes it worth the whole gig. You know, it's yeah. like, you might have like a 10 second snippet where it's like, Oh, this is amazing. <laughs> Or, I mean, you might get really lucky and the whole performance is just this magical experience. And that's kind of what we live for, you know. Uh, that's the deal, you know. Um, it so is. You know, what's interesting about that, too, is sometimes, like, if I've recorded the gig and I will be so high on the gig and then listen back later and I'm, it's like, that wasn't that great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but on the gig, yeah. it was great. And yeah, I, I always have to try and let the rest go because being there in the moment and experiencing that really, like you say, is, is the best. That's the deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what did I want to say? Oh, you know, I created these little stickers from kind of from this show and for this show it's just like a little thing but um so one was which i wanted to say that this is kind of the theme for this today let the heart have its way yeah <laughs> so that's i'm gonna i'm going to close off with that that's um i th definitely feel like that was part of the theme of today and you know, thanks for giving me two hours of your oh, time. It's really been fun to talk for two hours. Yeah, isn't it? likewise. Yeah. It's, it's, a, you know, I mean, we know each other, we played together, but talk, sit down and talk for two hours doesn't really happen so much unless you're, you know, really good friends and you do talk all the time, you know, yeah. but um, it's been really pleasurable. Oh, thank you so much, Kathy. It's been a great time for me. <laughs> I, uh, I can't wait to hear actually more of the big band writing and you said you're you said did you say you came out with a recording already and then you I did a, it was like a, yeah so what happened with the last one is uh it was a video recording so like that portion you saw it got put together with I think six of the other tunes into a documentary that they ran on Kentucky Public Television for a month or so uh last year and so the same, I'm doing the same thing this year. Uh, I am kind of lazy, so I haven't gotten around to kind of putting it up on Spotify or anything. But um, this year will be a non-at instead of a big band. So that's one of the things I learned. It's like a big band is a little unwieldy. <laughs> a non-at is going to have the same kind of effect and uh, with less people. So I think that might be a little less hurting of cats. <laughs> Well, we're going to look forward to hearing that. And um, <clears throat> can people go and hear you hear your records on Spotify or on Spotify as well as yeah, you can go to my website, Ryan And cool. uh, like I have some stuff available for purchase there. Okay. I honestly I haven't updated things in a while. But, <laughs> but I know, I, I know it's well, you know, I have job. a webmaster and but it's, ah. you know, I don't know every I don't know, nine months or so I update, but she's done really good by me. But, you know, it's because uh, I can't do it. I don't want to do it. Yeah, I have to hire the time her. suck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and also to learn the technology to be yeah. so that it comes out really good. Yeah. That's all right. She can do it. <laughs> I hear you. Money well spent. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan McGillicuddy. Um, Thank you, Kathy. And uh, just to tell people, um, Thursday through Sunday, the archives are up. John Prue actually is on tomorrow. Oh, awesome. um, Greta Matassa, great singer from Seattle, Friday, Saturday, Kathy Cousins, who's 
Um, oh yeah, I did some gigs with Kathy. Yeah, she's, she's great. great. Yeah. She's kind of a jazz R and B singer, fantastic, and a writer is she still and an in Detroit? artist. She is. Yeah, and she's a really good painter. Um, yeah. Then Anthony Wilson will be on Sunday. Oh. So really that's like, pretty cool and anybody who's in people i know and anybody who's in town and by the way you're 393 92. <laughs> you can but, tell anthony you can tell anthony that like my <laughs> nanette is modeled after his <laughs> okay I, i'll tell him i'll have to I tell love him his nanette writing it's just some of the most beautiful writing he's he's one of my very favorites oh he's brilliant yeah yeah but uh, I just wanted to say too that Saturday I'm singing. I have a gig that turns into a jam session after it at the conference room in Playa Vista for anybody who feels comfortable about coming out. Gary Fukushima, <laughs> John Leftwich, and Aaron Serfati. Oh yeah. And, um, it'll be inside. So if pe again people who feel comfortable, we did it last month and it was great. Awesome. So there you go. So Ryan McGillicuddy, thank you so much again. Thank you. All right, we'll see you, Kathy. I gotta get going, I gotta go pick up my daughter. <laughs> okay.